then, the Catholic lay people were the ones who kept religion alive. In Parramatta, Liverpool and Campbelltown, groups of Catholics would get together for prayer meetings. James Dempsey would say prayers with the men condemned to be hanged, and Michael Hayes continually wrote to his brother, a priest in Ireland, asking for a priest to be sent. So a priest must have arrived eventually. Yes, but not for another seven years. Father Jeremiah O'Flynn arrived in 1817. He had official authority from the church in Rome, but unfortunately not from Lord Bathurst, the Secretary of State for Colonies, who thought he was ill-educated. Father O'Flynn had met Michael Hayes' brother while in Rome, and impressed by the need for a priest in the colonies, he took it upon himself to come. Governor Macquarie, however, was not prepared to allow Father O'Flynn to minister publicly unless he had official documents from England. Undaunted by this, O'Flynn went about the colony quite openly, saying mass, baptizing and marrying anyone who asked. The governor was not at all pleased and ordered O'Flynn to leave the colony on the next ship. Instead, O'Flynn went into hiding. For four months, O'Flynn evaded the law until he was captured in May 1818 and put on board a ship to England. Tradition says that a consecrated host was left behind in William Davis's house near the present St. Patrick's at Church Hill. Once again, the colony was without a Catholic priest. However, due to the publicity Father O'Flynn's exploits had created, Two priests were sent to Australia with official status in May 1820. They were fathers John Terry and Philip Connolly. That means most of the time during the first 30 years of the colony, the people were without a priest. So it was the people who kept the church alive. You betcha. That's really interesting. You know, Anne, I'm not supposed to indulge in gossip, but there are people who live near here who are descendants of one of those Irish rebels that I mentioned. Yeah, who? You remember that I mentioned a William Davis? You don't mean the Davis kids next door? Yes, Anne. Louise and Christopher Davis are descendants of William Davis's family, as is their father, and his father before him. Wow. I should go talk to them. I'll visit them first thing in the morning. Anne. Coming. That's a good idea, Anne. I'm glad I could have been of some assistance. Anne? Anne, are you there? I guess I'll just sit here then. <whistles> it's so lonely being a computer. In consequence of William Davis being a trustee of the church, his remains will be attended from the cathedral to the grave. May he rest in peace. Amen. find out more about William Davis, who was closely involved in the early church in Australia. Dad, my computer, told me that Louise and Chris Davis from next door were descendants of his family. Oh hi, come in. Thanks. Chris and Louise were working on a family tree. They hadn't done much of it yet, but they did tell me that the most famous member of their family was William Davis, who had arrived in the colony as a convict in 1800. Is this William Davis up here? How come you haven't got the rest of them? Because we haven't found out many yet. Oh. William, he came over from Ireland from Burr. William Davis was born in 1765 in Burr and lived in Enniscorthy in the county of Wexford, 
The people of this county were involved in the rebellion against the British in 1798. Chris and Louise thought it would be a good idea to visit their Aunt Margaret. She had been collecting information and would be able to tell us more about the Davis family. Davis, who came out here um, as a convict. Margaret has a Bible which has been in her family for about 150 years. It had been given to her great-grandfather, John Davis, by Father Terry. The names of John's wife and children are written in the back. This Bible that was given to my great-grandfather, uh, Mr John Davis, who was the grand-nephew of William Davis. He came out to Australia in about the year 1843. John Davis was William's grand-nephew, and when he arrived in Sydney, he lived in this cottage in Harrington Street. When William died, John continued to live in the cottage and looked after the three orphans who had been adopted by William. Margaret told us about Kevin Davis. His grandfather, also called William, was one of the orphans. Old William Davis arrived in Australia on the convict ship Friendship in 1800. He was sent out here because of his involvement, alleged involve, involvement with the 1798 rebellion. William Davis was a blacksmith in Ireland. Blacksmiths often made weapons and as a result, William was suspected of making pikes and supplying them to those plotting against the British. William was arrested two or three months before the actual outbreak of the 1798 rebellion and he was sent to the colony without even a trial. He was an unconvicted convict. In those days, of course, blacksmiths were, uh, were very suspect in the new colony. There was no great fear in the colony at the time by the, the British authorities that the Irish political prisoners particularly uh, would uh, revolt, seize power and uh, uh, wreak revenge for the treatment that had been handed out to them. As a result, there was in 1800, four years before the outbreak at Castle Hill, the Irish convicts at Parramatta were suspected of plotting a rebellion. The Reverend Samuel Marsden reported William Davis as a suspect. Even though no evidence was found against him, William Davis was sentenced to 200 lashes. There is no evidence in the official documents that the sentence was carried out, and so it really can't be verified. The Reverend Dr Ullathorne knew William Davis personally. He states in his writings that William was flogged twice for refusing to go to Protestant services. He also says that Davis was imprisoned in a black hole for so long that he almost lost his sight. All this probably took place well before 1809 because by then William had married Catherine Miles and they were living in Harrington Street. Davis had no children of his own. He brought out, however, some of the children of his two brothers and his sister Mary in Ireland. One of those nephews was Joseph Davis. Joseph Davis married in Australia and had three young children. The three children were Joseph, William and Catherine. When Joseph and his wife died, so William adopted the three children as his own. They lived with him in the cottage in Harrington Street. The cottage now forms part of the foundations of the convent of the Sisters of Mercy and was probably built in 1809, about the time William married Catherine Miles. There is evidence that it was in this cottage that the consecrated host was kept when Father Jeremiah O'Flynn was forced to leave the colony by Governor Macquarie in 1818. We asked Kevin if he thought the host had been left in the Davis cottage. I believe it was and that there is a very strong reason for believing that. Firstly, from a family point of view, my grandfather lived in that cottage, knew Davis, lived with Davis, and my grandfather told always to his own family the circumstances under which the present sacrament had been left. There is outside evidence as well, which I think is quite persuasive. 
And that comes from a very well-known vicar, Dr. Ullathorne, who was the vicar general. At the laying of the foundation stone of St. Patrick's Church in 1840, Dr. Ullathorne mentioned in his sermon that the host was left in William's cottage. It was there the most holy Eucharist remained so long, with no human but with its own divine omnipotent protection. And it was the centre of the devotion of the people, deprived of clerical aid. It was there... Preserved inside this box is a silken cover. It is believed that this cover protected the picks that held the host while it was in Davis's cottage. It is also believed that this statue and candlestick were in the cottage at that time. William Davis made many contributions to the church. He gave the land for the building of St Patrick's Church at Church Hill, but unfortunately he died before it was completed. He served for many years in the committee for the building of the first Catholic chapel, St Mary's. This letter, for example, written in 1822, shows that William Davis was one of the prominent people in the colony, helping Father John Terry at that time. In 1834, William Davis was still in the committee for St Mary's Church. It was burnt down in 1865 and replaced by the present St Mary's Cathedral. When the Sisters of Charity first arrived in Sydney, William rented a house for them at Parramatta. Later, the Sisters needed a more permanent residence, so he gave them most of the money to buy this house on the present site of the Sisters of Mercy Convent, Parramatta. In the Mitchell Library, we discovered records that show how William and Catherine Davis prospered. The muster of 1814 showed that William had obtained full pardon and that he was a landowner. Catherine Davis also had her own property. In the 1832 Australian, she advertised some of it for rent. She also had her own millinery shops, as this advertisement in the Sydney Gazette of 1834 shows. The census of 1828 also showed that William and Catherine owned various other properties, cattle and sheep. Davis, remember, the penniless convicts had come a long way by that time was one of the people called to a meeting by Captain Macquarie to set up a bank in New South Wales. It was known as the Bank of New South Wales, now Westpac. Davis bought two shares worth 50 pounds each. So he was an original shareholder in the Westpac Bank. Gertrude Davy, whom we also visited, is a descendant of William's brother John. Gertrude has some very old letters written in 1843 and 44. You see how they used to send letters out in those days? Yeah. This letter came from Ireland in 1843. It was written by Catherine Davis to her son John, who was living at the cottage. Ship's mail, they used to call it. And no, no stamp, because I don't think they had stamps in those days anyway. Mr John Davis, Church Hill or Street, Sydney. Both letters mention William Davis. My dear child, I would wish to know every circumstances concerning your uncle with regard to you and how he treats you. That's William Davis she's speaking of, his uncle, you see. His time here can't be long. He is 80 years old and better. This letter was written only a month before William died. The second letter, written a year later, tells us of William's death. Mr Connor wrote to your father informing him of your uncle's death. Also a newspaper cutting on account of the old man's funeral. We received this account in four months and a fortnight. 
after the old man was buried. But why not a letter from you? William Davis died on the 17th of August, 1843. In his will, he left considerable amounts of property and wealth to his family and the church. Davis's will is an interesting document. It was carefully drawn up. It was signed by him three or four days before he died. The bequests in that will show very clearly the wealth that he had managed to acquire. Land at Darling Harbour, for example. Land at Potts Point. Land at Campbelltown. Shares in various early companies in Australia. So the story of Davis from a penniless convict in 1800 